Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Self mummification. Japan is famous for many things, but mummies aren't one of them. Mummies are not very common here at all, mostly because of the climate. There are no deserts, no humid peat bogs, and no tall mountains encased in ice. There's nowhere ideal to mummify a human being, but that didn't stop the self sacrificing Soku Shinbutsu. There were actually at least 17 people that became mummies between 1081 and 1903. A small group of Buddhist monks discovered how to mummify themselves through rigorous training in a shadowy part of Japan in the northern prefecture of Yamagata. And even though some scientists claim the number of mummified monks could be higher, only 17 of them have been discovered so far. How did they do it? The first monk to turn himself into a mummy was a man named Shojin, who did it in 1081. His plan was to mummify himself and then come back to life in the future to spread goodness among mankind. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Over the next several hundred years, other monks would try to perfect the process. Natural self-mummification involves three years of preparation before dying. For 1,000 days, monks will slowly starve themselves down to just skin and bones, only eating what they forage from the mountain. Then, they slowly drink a poisonous lacquer made from the sap of the urushi, the lacquer tree, so their organs wouldn't rot after death. When the monk felt like they were about to die, they would be placed in an underground tomb where they sat in the lotus position, reciting chants and ringing a bell so the disciples would know he was still alive. When the bell stopped, they believed the monk had entered eternal meditation. The monk's body was typically left underground for three years and three months until it had fully hardened. If the process was complete, the body was considered a true Soku Shinbutsu and enshrined. The last monk to mummify himself did so in 1903, 30 years after this was considered a criminal and barbaric act. His preserved remains were found in 1961 by a team of researchers working with Tohoku University. His remains are now on display in the nearby Niigata Prefecture. The Dark Watchers Visitors to California have discovered something extremely disturbing. There are beings known as Dark Watchers apparently watching Californians from the high peaks of the Santa Lucia Mountains. These figures typically appear at twilight. They are extremely tall, cloaked in strange clothing, and undoubtedly eerie. Some claim the Dark Watchers are 10 feet tall and wear creepy hats and capes. If you spot them, they will stare at you and then disappear. And even though there were some bizarre sightings recently, the Dark Watchers were originally discovered over 300 years ago, when the Spanish arrived in the 1700s. The Spanish actually called these apparitions Los Vigilantes Oscuros, or the Dark Watchers, or Night Watchmen in English. And according to legend, when settlers began arriving in the region, they too discovered they were being watched by mysterious beings from the tops of the mountains. One famous observer who felt the presence of the Watchers was the American author John Steinbeck. Remember, Grapes of Wrath and all that we had to read in high school? In his 1938 short story, Flight, a character sees a black figure leering down at him from a nearby ridgetop. No one knew who the Watchers were, nor where they lived, but it was better to ignore them and never to show interest in them. But just what are the Dark Watchers? One of the most popular theories is that the beings are actually just hallucinations, the exact type of hallucination that a person experiences when they see a dragon in a cloud or a face on the moon. Some claim there are no Watchers at all, but simply shadows being interpreted as giant monsters come dusk. Still, this has not stopped hikers visiting the Santa Lucia Mountains from reporting strange floating beings high up on the peaks. Could they really just be hallucinations? Or is there something greater out there still to discover? The Oldest Idol A creepy and very old sculpture in the shape of a human figure with a spooky face predates even the Great Pyramids of Giza. The idol is shaped like a giant and is the oldest of its kind ever discovered on Earth. This thing is known as the Shigir Idol because it was found in the Shigir peat bog in the Ural Mountains of Russia in 1890. But even though the sculpture was discovered just over 100 years ago, it was actually made around 12,000 years ago. To put into perspective just how old this sculpture is, it was around to witness the extinction of hordes of animals after the Ice Age, such as the dire wolf and the woolly mammoth, it's 7,000 years older than Stonehenge and no less impressive. The sculpture, when first made, would have stood nearly 18 feet tall. This makes it the earliest monumental wooden sculpture ever, 
according to a team of researchers from the State Agency of Heritage Service in Germany. What's totally bizarre is that nobody has any real idea of who built the idol or just what it was made to represent. The geometric patterns and zigzag lines are common elements from the Paleolithic and the early Mesolithic. And to be quite honest, it's one of the oldest and most obscure archaeological mysteries on the planet. If we don't even know who built Stonehenge, how can we possibly know who built a wooden sculpture 7,000 years before? The Catacomb Saints The Catacomb Saints were once Christian martyrs who were buried inside the catacombs of Rome. The Catacomb Saints were exhumed from their place of burial in Italy and then sent abroad, where they each served as a relic of a particular saint from between the 16th and 19th century. The reason that the saints were sent throughout Europe to places like Germany or Switzerland was because starting in the 16th century, Catholic churches throughout Europe began to be stripped of their religious symbols and relics. The church appeared far too luxurious and rich, and in the UK, Henry VIII completely denounced the Catholic Church and made himself the head of the new Church of England, so the Pope had no more authority. This was bad news for the Catholic Church, and they entered a period of crisis. To unload some of their cumbersome wealth, the Church began to dig bodies out of the catacombs and announce them as Christian martyrs, though it's believed most of them were probably people of little religious significance. Each skeleton was dressed in finery of gold, jewels, silver, trinkets, and even full suits of golden armor. They were then gifted or sold to wealthy families as relics of saints. But here's the deal. Many of the saints were likely made up. Some of the saints even shared the same name as the wealthy family that served as their patron. In the end, it was a sneaky way for the church to decorate thousands of skeletons in gold and jewels, including stuffing as much finery as possible into eye sockets and headdresses and then giving them to wealthy families in exchange for patronage. It was a big loophole that allowed the church to sell tons of gold and jewels. Today, the catacomb saints are mostly gone, though there are still some sitting in museums across Europe, and some still remain in private collections. The Grasshopper Diet About 1400 years ago, a man living in the lower Pecos Canyon lands of Texas suffered such a horrible spell of constipation that he died. At least, this is according to a recent study of the man's mummified remains. The new study revealed that for several months before this man's death, he ate basically nothing except grasshoppers. He had such a weird diet because he'd already caught something known as Chagas disease. This is a disease caused by a parasite, and it was so deadly that it backed up the man's gastrointestinal system and caused his colon to swell to at least six times its normal size, a scientific condition known as megacolon, and it's something no one should ever have to experience. This man became so sick that he was unable to digest foods and became malnourished. He couldn't even walk. Probably for the last three months of his life, he was cared for by his family, who fed him nothing but grasshoppers, which would have been easier for his messed up body to digest. The remains of this poor man were discovered in 1937, inside of a rock shelter in southern Texas. His body had been naturally mummified because of the dry conditions. His preserved corpse was put inside a museum until it was loaned to the Institute of Texan Cultures in 1968. It wasn't until just recently that scientists learned of his unusual diet and medical affliction. Mass Burial Site A team of archaeologists working in southeastern Poland were shocked to recently discover a mass burial site with no less than 119 tombs. This horrifying discovery revealed the skeletal remains of children and other young people buried near the small village of Jove, many of whom were discovered with coins inside of their mouths. The coins were likely intended to help the dead reach the afterlife, much like the ancient Greek myth of Charon and the River Styx. Archaeologists were able to date the remains of the burial structures to the 17th century, and the coins were minted under the rule of King Sigismund III. Since approximately 80% of the remains were from children, this means that the mortality rate for children at that time was significantly high. Also, since they were buried without any worthy possessions, archaeologists believe that the remains were likely from poor families. As of right now, there isn't much more that archaeologists can tell us since they are still working on uncovering the fragile bones. It's not clear why the mortality rate in this corner of Poland was so high in the 17th century, or if there was some kind of epidemic that grossly affected young people. For now, we just have to wait. Creepy New Fossil Researchers just discovered the shocking remains of a previously unknown reptile that lived during the early Triassic period. The bizarre creature appeared between 247 and 251 million years ago, 
coming into existence right around the largest mass extinction event in our planet's history at the end of the Permian era. This extinction event wiped out at least 95% of marine life and over 70% of the land species. The cause? Probably volcanic eruptions and global warming. During this time, there was a group of animals called tanistrophades. These have given scientists a lot of headaches because very few specimens have been recovered, but it looks like they did well in the wake of disaster. They have spent a really long time trying to figure them out. What we do know is that these animals had really long necks and probably lived in shallow bodies of water. Their necks were so long, they included anywhere between 8 and 13 elongated vertebrae. The long neck carried down to an elongated spine that was low to the ground. The most recent fossil found in Brazil has turned out to be the cousin of a tanistrophade, and it's been named the Elisaurus. The Elisaurus was a long-legged creature that somehow survived and thrived during the Permian extinction, diversifying and spreading across the world to live all throughout the old supercontinent of Gondwana, which once consisted of Antarctica, Africa, South America, India, Australia, and even New Zealand. How exactly this monster went extinct, or what it evolved into, is still a mystery. Whale Vomit When Ken Willman was walking his dog along the beach in England, his dog began to make a bit of a fuss. Ken's dog had found what looked to be a rock, but according to what Ken told the BBC, when he picked up the rock and smelled it, it definitely didn't smell like any old rock. Ken took the rock home and did a quick Google search to see just what kind of a lump he had found. It turned out that Ken's dog had found a piece of ambergris, which comes directly from the digestive tract of a sperm whale. Would you have brought this home with you? I don't think I would have picked it up and smelled it. I don't know. How about you? But good thing Ken did. Ambergris does not smell good, but it is one of the most expensive ingredients found in many luxury fragrances. It's worth an absolute fortune. It's not quite clear what ambergris actually is. Some people call it whale poop, others whale vomit, but neither one is actually correct. Nobody knows how ambergris is created. All scientists know is that it comes from inside the whale's intestines and might be used as a type of fatty coating to help whales digest things like squid beaks. Immediately after Ken's shocking discovery, a French ambergris dealer offered him $68,000 for the piece he had found on the beach. But according to the curator from the Aquarium of the Lakes in Cumbria, the piece could actually be worth as much as $180,000. Never take the first offer. Nobody knows if Ken has gone through with any sales yet, but he definitely stumbled upon a small fortune, all thanks to his dog. Neolithic Salt Archaeologists recently discovered the oldest salt production housing in Britain during a dig in East Cleveland. The salt production housing has been dated older than Stonehenge. The find was incredibly rare, with researchers saying that the salt production was likely of high value to the community that ran it sometime around 3800 BC. And it was probably passed down for hundreds of years after into the Neolithic period. The Neolithic people produced salt by evaporating seawater into a brine solution and then heating it in pots. The pots were then broken to collect the salt. The excavation was done by Dr. Steve Sherlock and his team of researchers. One of the reasons the find is indeed so significant is that it puts a timeline on when early Britons began changing from nomadic hunters and gatherers to settled farmers. Ancient communities who worked together to produce salt often benefited from extreme wealth. They were the capitalists of their day. The excavation of the salt production facility revealed three hearths, hundreds upon hundreds of pottery shards, old stone tools, and of course, lots of traces of salt. All of these things were key to early salt production. Shipwreck Remains A warship was recently discovered sunk at the bottom of the Mekong River in Cambodia's Kampong Cham province. The warship had been sunk during the bloody civil war that went down in Cambodia in the 1970s. A team of underwater recovery specialists were investigating the wreckage when they discovered the old remains of a soldier who had likely been on the warship when it sank. The original team of researchers were sent to the bottom of the Mekong River to take out the unexploded bombs and dispose of them safely. They hadn't expected to find the bones of a fallen soldier. According to the research team, the soldier had likely been guarding the ship. They even found his name tag. The young soldier's name was Chim Chingli. The government has since called on the man's family to claim his bones and give him a proper burial. As for the warship, officials found a significant amount of unexploded ordnance. They also discovered 60mm shells, 
105 mm shells, and almost 55,000 bullets from handguns and machine guns. And this was only from a single section of the ship. This thing was equipped for battle. The ship was actually used to transport ammunition between 1970 and 1975, until it exploded and sank to the bottom of the river, probably in late 73 or early 74. Antirodos Sometime during the 4th century, the Egyptian city of Alexandria was hit by a huge earthquake, followed by a tsunami of epic proportions. An island called Antirodos was sunk during the process, taking with it Cleopatra's palace and a former wonder of the ancient world, the Lighthouse of Alexandria. This reportedly happened a few centuries after Cleopatra's death, and her palace is rumored to be buried in a small bay under 10 to 20 feet of murky water. Greek geographers and historians describe the island and its location in texts, helping people remember that it once existed, even though nobody knew where it was. It was also known as Anti-Rhodes because of its competition with the actual island of Rhodes. The sunken island and its royal contents remained largely a mystery until the 1990s, when a French archaeologist named Frank Gaudiot studied the ancient writings of the Greek historian Strabo. Intrigued by Strabo's records and accompanied by a diving team, a determined Gaudio set out to find the lost island. Problem was that Strabo wasn't very precise and had actually gotten the location wrong, but after several searches, they found it. It was a small island occupied before Alexandria was founded, and excavations revealed a royal house belonging to Cleopatra, along with what may even be her tomb, and a temple dedicated to Isis, one of the greatest goddesses of ancient Egypt. There was also a small port with a Roman wreck nearby, and Mark Antony's half-finished palace. While some artifacts remain at the site, over 140 of the most valuable and well-preserved pieces have been taken to a museum for people to enjoy. Olus Home to a population of around 40,000 at its peak, Olus was a Dorian city of ancient Crete, situated along the Aegean Sea. The ruins are so close to shore, they are visible to the naked eye. Olus was one of around 100 Minoan cities that flourished between 3000 and 900 BC. At the time, it fell along a major trade route that connected northern Crete with the Aegean Islands and the rest of the Mediterranean. Because the city is conspicuously absent from historical texts, most of what experts know is gleaned from archaeological evidence. Findings from underwater surveys fall in line with the suspicion that Olus was a wealthy port city. In addition to basic buildings, the ruins include roads and the remains of a Hellenistic fortification, consisting of a defensive wall and tower. Archaeologists have also found coins dating back between 330 and 280 BC, and inscriptions linking Olus with the ancient city of Knossos and the island of Rhodes. Remember, the enemy of anti-Rhodes! Cemetery tombs, marble statue fragments, and an early Byzantine-era basilica indicate that the settlement thrived during Roman times. Researchers have trouble figuring out why Olus became submerged. Some attribute its sinking to rising sea levels, while others believe that a volcanic eruption on the nearby island of Santorini or an earthquake triggered its tragic demise. Any of these scenarios are possible, but sea level patterns point toward the likelihood that the site was consumed by rising waters. Dwarka Located in the state of Gujarat in northwestern India, the modern-day city of Dwarka is one of four sacred Hindu pilgrimage sites and one of the country's seven most ancient religious cities. But there is another, older, legendary version of the city that was believed to be nothing but myth. But now archaeologists have found submerged ruins under the sea. There are rumors that the site represents the mythical city of Dwarka founded by Lord Krishna, an important character of Hindu mythology. Krishna summoned divine powers to build the city, complete with a massive stone wall to protect it. Also known as Davaraka, the city had 900,000 royal palaces, all made with pure silver and jewels, with gardens everywhere and the sound of birds singing and bees humming. When Lord Krishna died, the kingdom sank into the sea. Excavations of the underwater sites have been ongoing for decades, revealing interior and exterior walls and fort bastions, just like the mythical city. There are also some other unidentified structures, as well as a stone-built jetty, triangular stone anchors, stone sculptures, terracotta beads, and bronze, copper, and iron objects. The style of the anchor suggests that Dwarka was one of the busiest ports on India's west coast during its Middle Kingdom period, which lasted from the 3rd century BC to the 13th century AD. Scientists from the Archaeological Survey of India's Marine Archaeological Unit 
also found inscriptions dating back to 1500 BC and pottery from as early as 3528 BC. Some claim that the site is as much as 9,500 years old based on the last time the land it sits on was allegedly above water, which would make it older than the Sumerians. Phanagoria Founded around 543 BC by ancient Greeks fleeing from war in Asia Minor, today modern-day Turkey, Phanagoria was a coastal settlement on the Taman Peninsula in what is now Russia. Covering an area of around 190 acres, it was a bustling trade center and one of the most influential settlements along the Black Sea. Several times during the course of its history, Phanagoria was attacked by invading armies, especially as its importance increased. But the city managed to maintain its dominance in the region through its loyalty to the powerful Roman Empire, until the Huns sacked and destroyed it during the 4th century. After all that, Phanagoria managed to regain its power and continued to flourish until sometime during the 10th century, when it succumbed to an invasion for the final time. There's only so much a city can take. The settlement was ultimately abandoned and a new city was built over its ruins during the Middle Ages, but that city was also deserted and the site has not been inhabited since. The ruins of Phanagoria were rediscovered during the 18th century. Excavations of the vast metropolis yielded discoveries of marble statue bases dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, gold and silver artifacts, an inscription dedicated to the Emperor Augustus, and crypts dating as far back as 1500 years. About one-third of Phanagoria has sunk beneath the sea amid rising sea levels. Excavations of the site are ongoing both on dry land and underwater. That's fun! The partial sinking of the site serves as an ominous warning about what will probably eventually happen to the rest of it. Port Royal Once known as the most wicked and sinful city in the world, Port Royal was located on what used to be Jamaica's southeastern coast. It became one of the New World's largest European cities by the late 17th century, and it was a haven for vice. Las Vegas is nothing compared to Port Royal. Rife with drunkenness, prostitution, and other forms of debauchery that I can't really go into, the natural harbor was at one point controlled by the notorious pirate Henry Morgan, who became lieutenant governor in 1675. It was basically pirate heaven. But the sinful city's glory days would be short-lived. On June 7, 1692, a massive 7.5 magnitude earthquake struck Jamaica, instantly liquefying the sand that Port Royal was mostly built on top of and submerging buildings, roads, and people into the Caribbean Sea. Next came tsunami waves, which wiped out most of the remaining undestroyed parts of the city. Altogether, 33 acres of Port Royal plunged into the water, killing around 2,000 people and destroying four of its five ports. Even after Port Royal was destroyed, its corrupt culture lived on. According to historical accounts, opportunists began looting and committing violent acts before the ground even stopped shaking from the earthquake. Many looked at the city's demise as a sign of divine retribution. God was punishing the people of Port Royal for their wayward activities. Today, Port Royal's remains lie beneath up to 40 feet of water. Archaeological excavations have produced rarely seen 17th century artifacts including a pocket watch stopped at 1143 and dated to 1686. The submerged site has been likened to an underwater Pompeii, with its remains left as is since the fateful moment it sank without warning. Atlit Yam As sea levels rose after the last ice age, coastlines around the world shrank, submerging settlements and forcing people to repeatedly move inland. Of the dozens of these underwater sites that dot the modern-day Israeli shore, Adlit Yam is among the best preserved. Situated in the Bay of Adlit along the Haifa coast between 26 and 36 feet below today's sea levels, this pre-pottery Neolithic village dates back 9,000 years. Marine archaeologists discovered the prehistoric settlement in the 1980s and excavated it between then and the year 2000. During that time, they found numerous artifacts revealing how people dealt with the rapidly changing environment and introduced new technologies. Adli Diam contains the world's earliest known freshwater wells, with seven megalithic stones surrounding a spring in the middle of the site. Additionally, archaeologists found the remains of around 100 plants, indicating that the inhabitants ate a traditional, well-balanced Mediterranean diet, enabling some people to live to the ripe old age of 50 years old, which constituted a long life back then. I mean, remember, it's 9,000 years ago. 
Bones of fish, wild animals, and domestic livestock show that Atli Diem subsisted on a mixed economy of agriculture and husbandry combined with hunting, fishing, and gathering. Unlike most settlements of this type, Atli Diem yielded numerous human burials, which bear evidence of a population that struggled with malaria, tuberculosis, and an ear condition related to cold water diving. These findings prove that tuberculosis is at least 3,000 years older than scientists previously thought and helped to shed light on the disease's bacterial evolution into modern times. Residents also combated the elements amid a warming climate, dealing with chronic flooding that ultimately caused them to abandon the site, an ominous realization that some coastal communities are having to face today. And now for a lost Greek city, but first wanted to give a quick shout out to Miss Selenius and Andy Christie. Love hanging out with you all and thanks for spending time over here. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already and let me know which city you wish still existed in real life in the comments below. Pablo Petri Situated in Vatica Bay off Greece's Peloponnese coast, Pablo Petri was a Bronze Age city that was inhabited from the 3rd millennium BC to around 1100 BC making it around 5,000 years old. It's the oldest known submerged ancient Greek settlement and one of the oldest sites in the world. Oceanographer Nicholas Fleming is credited with discovering Pablo Petri after having visited the site in 1967. He returned the following year with a colleague and some archaeologists who went underwater and mapped out the entire freshly discovered city. They documented buildings, organized streets, and public squares. Subsequent investigations in recent years have uncovered thousands of artifacts, including large Minoan jars, tableware, and other everyday objects, offering an unprecedented glimpse into the everyday lives of Pablo Petri's residents. Architectural features such as gardens, temples, a cemetery, and a water management system have also been found. Researchers believe that the city was a major Minoan and Mycenaean commerce center that sank into the Mediterranean Sea during the first of three catastrophic earthquakes to strike the area. The disaster literally stopped life in its tracks, leaving the underwater site more or less frozen in time since the moment it plunged below the surface. However, now Pablo Petri is threatened by tourists, souvenir hunters, and boats that drag their anchors through the area. Lion City Nicknamed China's Atlantis, Shi Cheng, also called the Lion City, was established around 1300 years ago and was an important urban center in the area, but now lies hidden underwater. It was deliberately flooded in 1959 and was soon forgotten about. Situated at the foot of Wuxi Mountain, roughly 250 miles south of Shanghai, it remained inhabited until the mid-20th century when nearly 300,000 residents were relocated to make way for a man-made lake as part of a hydroelectric power plant construction project. A local official was on a mission to make the lake more attractive to tourists, so he met up with a diving club and they began exploring the area. To everyone's surprise, Shi Cheng was there. After lying undisturbed for over half a century, its structures remained perfectly preserved. Underwater explorers discovered five entrance gates to the city as well as five towers, which was extremely unique because most cities have four for the four cardinal directions. So what was the fifth entrance? They also found 265 archways featuring carved lions, dragons, and inscriptions. The structures at Shi Cheng date as far back as 1400 years, although many are newer, having originated during the Ming and Qing dynasties, which ruled from 1368 to 1912. Experts believe that the walls surrounding the small 0.2 square mile site were built during the 16th century. Shi Cheng sits beneath 85 to 131 feet of water, which has protected it from the elements over the last several decades. The site is open to advanced divers and is offering tours for people to go exploring. Mahabali Puram When a historically destructive tsunami hit the Indian coast in 2004, Onlookers in the town of Mahabalipuram watched as a long row of granite boulders emerged from the ocean before the massive wave consumed them once again. What was it? Years later, a team of scientists from India's National Institute of Oceanography found the remains of an ancient port settlement in that exact location, 2,624 feet from the shoreline. Sunken beneath 27 feet of water are a 33-foot-long wall, a flight of stairs, and chiseled stone blocks scattered along the seabed. Unfortunately, the structures were covered with plant growth, making it difficult for the team to identify them. The head of the Marine Archaeological Unit said that they could make out that they were part of a building complex. 
Researchers believe the buildings are between 1,100 and 1,500 years old. Discoveries like this are paving the way for potential opportunities for archaeologists to further explore India's submerged history by increasing the chances of securing government funding for future excavations. Simena Dating back to around 2000 BC, the ancient city of Simena was a small fishing village during ancient times. Located near the uninhabited island of Kekova of modern-day Antalya, Turkey, the Lycian settlement was also an important trading post. The Lycian civilization was unique to the Mediterranean coast of present-day Turkey, making Simena an important archaeological site. Made up of a democratic union of cities known as the Lycian League, Lycia is considered one of the world's first democratic systems. Simena boasted the smallest Lycian amphitheater, an acropolis, shipyard, church, temple, walls, and more. Not sure why you want to brag about having the smallest theater, but it's cute. Several of these structures and features sank during the second century when a series of cataclysmic earthquakes gradually submerged the city, which sat right at the water's edge until then. Some of Simena's ruins, including some residential homes and staircases, still peek up from the water, making them visible to the naked eye. The remains of the city's public baths can be found along the shore, with an inscription identifying them as a gift from the people to the Emperor Titus. Unfortunately, if you are hoping to view this sunken part of the city up close and personal, you're out of luck. Diving and snorkeling are prohibited at the site, which is a designated, specially protected area to protect it from damage. Meanwhile, Simena is on the tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. You can, however, catch a glimpse of the ruins from above via the occasional tour boats that slow down as they pass through the ancient harbor. The Mariana Trench Deepest Depths The Mariana Trench is the deepest place on Earth. The enormous trench is shaped like a crescent and located in the western Pacific, very near the Mariana Islands, hence the name. Not only does the Mariana Trench contain the deepest point on Earth, but it also contains several of the deepest points known to mankind. There are mud volcanoes inside, strange creatures we've yet to meet, and pressures that are 1,000 times what you get at sea level. The reason we don't know much about the Mariana Trench is because of how deep it is. At the southern end of the trench is Challenger Deep, the lowest spot in the ocean. The best estimates we have say that Challenger Deep is 36,070 feet. This measurement comes from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who use special sound pulses to properly measure its depth. The second deepest place in the world is also located inside the Mariana Trench. It's known as Sirena Deep, and it's a blistering 35,462 feet deep. It's also located about 124 miles east of Challenger Deep. To give you a comparison of just how deep the Mariana Trench is, if you took Mount Everest and flipped it upside down, there would still be 7,044 feet to go before you reach the bottom. Skydivers jump out of airplanes at about 7,000 feet, meaning the Mariana Trench is as deep as Everest is tall, plus the distance of skydiving from the clouds to the ground. Horrifying Creatures The Mariana Trench is so massive that we simply don't know what's down there. After you descend 3,000 feet into the ocean, there is absolutely no sunlight to witness life forms. The few creatures we have discovered living in the trench are absolutely horrifying. Plus, scientists say we have barely scratched the surface of life in this great ocean gulf. Still, we can get a pretty good idea of just what kind of goblins are living in the Mariana Trench by looking at the creatures we've already discovered. First on the list is the Dumbo Octopus a cute yet bizarre octopus with ears like Dumbo the elephant. This is the deepest dwelling octopus known to us so far, living at about 13,000 feet deep. Cute, right? Then we have the deep sea dragonfish, one of the most horrific animals ever. The dragonfish is an assassin with no scales and a slippery and slimy skin just like an eel. These monsters live about 6,000 feet deep and rely on bioluminescent body parts to help them hunt. Then we have the barrel eye fish, something that looks like it belongs in another dimension. The fish is incredibly rare and has a translucent body that allows you to see straight through its skin and into its brain. Researchers have only found a handful of these fish, and they live about 2,500 feet deep. Last but not least is the goblin shark. This toothy creature looks like somebody blended a shark with an orc from the Lord of the Rings. It has a snout that looks like a sword with protruding jaws and pink skin. 
Some of them can grow to be as big as 18 feet. They live at least 3,000 feet beneath the surface. Diving deeper into the Mariana Trench, the older they get. Undersea Volcanoes There are more than monsters in the Mariana Trench. Researchers used a remotely operated vehicle to explore some of the deeper waters of the trench, and much to their surprise, they were able to document a volcanic eruption going on about 2.8 miles below the surface of the ocean. It has been described as the deepest eruption ever recorded on our planet. To give you an idea of just how deep the volcano is, it's located deeper inside the Mariana Trench than Mount Rainier is high above the sea level. Researchers say the eruption happened sometime between 2013 and 2015. It happened in a zone within the trench called the Back Arc. This is an area on the sea floor with many active volcanoes. Marine geologist Bill Chadwick from Oregon State University recently said in a statement that almost all of the world's volcanic activity does indeed take place under the ocean, with almost none of it being detected by scientists. Submarine eruptions, as they're known, are elusive despite their frequency. This particular eruption was discovered in 2015 by cameras on an ROV. The cameras captured photographs of a dark lava flow spreading across the sea floor. The camera also witnessed hydrothermal vent fluid venting from the lava flow, indicating that the lava was warm and fresh. And this is just another reason why it's so hard to explore the Mariana Trench. The last thing explorers want is to be burned alive by undersea lava. Mysterious Sounds an autonomous vehicle deep inside the Mariana Trench picked up a sound recording so creepy and so terrifying that it would make your hair stand on end. The sound clip is only three and a half seconds long. It was a mysterious metallic sound coming from deep inside the trench, and it took months and months of research for scientists to finally identify what they feel is the most likely source of the creepy audio. Was it something rumbling deep inside the earth? Scientists now believe that the noise was actually made by an animal, more specifically, a new type of baleen whale. According to Sharon Newkirk from Oregon State University, the low frequency moan of the whale was very distinct. It was the exact type of moan heard from other baleen whales, but this one was a bit more unique, a little twangy, and never before heard by scientists. This is amazing because to find a new type of whale in the ocean basically never happens anymore. The frequency of the sound spanned a range of between 38 hertz and 8,000 hertz. Sharon and her team of scientists were unable to find any human or geological sources that could have contributed to the noise. It definitely wasn't produced by a ship. The only thing that the sound could have been made by was a whale. So this leads to the question, what other things are deep down in the depths that we've never heard about? And now for some expeditions, but first, want to give a big shout out to Jamie Salmon and Mr. Dizzy Izzy. Thanks so much for joining our corner of the internet. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. Expeditions. Let's take a look at just how difficult it really is to explore the Mariana Trench. Because of the extreme conditions, there have only been a handful of people that have been able to go into the depths. The first dive into the bottom of the trench was in 1960 by Jacques Picard no relation to Star Trek, and Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh. These two men descended using an incredibly expensive United States Navy submersible known as a bathyscaphe. After years of preparation, the two men descended for five hours into the trench and then spent a paltry 20 minutes sitting at the bottom. They were unable to take photographs because they were sitting in a giant cloud of silt stirred up by their vessel. These guys sat there in complete darkness and could do absolutely nothing. The most exciting moment was when an unidentified fish moved in front of their giant floodlights, finally proving to the world that life definitely exists at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, something scientists had been debating before the journey. In 2019, Victor Vescovo became the new record holder when he made it to 10,927 meters below sea level. In total, Vescovo and his team made five dives to the bottom of the trench during the expedition. A submarine and robotic landers all spread out to explore and gather data of the harshest area of the ocean. Don Walsh from the 1960s expedition congratulated Victor for his historic exploration. They discovered new species and collected samples of microorganisms and rock samples. Prior to that in 2012, James Cameron had made a solo plunge in a bright green sub, going down nearly 11 kilometers or almost 7 miles. 
Billionaire investors are spending more and more on science and marine technology to try to continue going down into the trench, and are even working on building submarines to take tourists down to the deepest part of the ocean for $250,000 a ticket. Would you visit the trench if you could? Maybe not for $250,000, but maybe in the future if the price goes down? Let me know in the comments below. A lot of pressure. The pressure at the very bottom of the Mariana Trench is enough to crush a person into a pancake. The pressure would be equivalent to about 100 adult elephants standing directly on your head. If you've ever wondered why exactly the pressure gets so intense when you go underwater, it's because the weight of all that water is literally pushing down upon you. If you were to stand at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, there would be seven miles of water on top of you. That's seven miles of concentrated water pressing down on your skin and bones, and there's just no way your body can handle it. It's almost like being in outer space, the environment is just so different. The weight of water creates hydrostatic pressure. At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the pressure is so great that scientists believe it affects life in all kinds of strange ways, such as distorting the complex structures of biomolecules. These are DNA, proteins, and membranes. Because these biomolecules are distorted by the pressure, life adapts in a very strange way, creating squishy, weird animals. One of those animals is the gelatinous trench snailfish, living around 25,000 feet deep, and other extremely dark, gooey creatures, some with teeth, some with bioluminescence. You just never know what you're going to get. Undiscovered Monsters There have been some rumors flying around that giant, undiscovered monsters are living in the Mariana Trench. Since there are sounds and animals we are just now learning about, could there be some enormous monster like a kraken or even a living megalodon hiding out in the deepest undersea gorge? The answer is maybe. Perhaps not a megalodon, but maybe something else. We know today that life is abundant inside the trench. Missions using unmanned vehicles have discovered strange creatures living on the sea floor in the deepest parts of the ocean. Some of these animals are gigantic, products of what is known as deep sea gigantism, giant isopods, for example. These crustaceans look exactly like the pill bugs you find in your garden. The only difference is that the giant isopod is roughly two feet long, if not longer. Then we have giant colossal squids to consider, which are far larger than common squids and live in the deepest parts of the ocean. Following this trend, it's safe to say that something big or even giant may be living in the Mariana Trench. We just haven't encountered it yet. However, megalodons went extinct a very long time ago, and they fed on blubberous mammals like seals and whales that breathe air. So we should have seen one by now. But perhaps there is another kind of mega shark lurking that we can't even imagine. The Formation of the Trench To understand a bit more about how hard it is to explore the Mariana Trench, we should look at just how this amazing geological feature was formed. The trench was created by a process known as subduction. The crust of the earth is made of plates which float on the molten rock of the mantle. Because these plates are floating on the mantle, their edges sometimes bump into one another and cause things like earthquakes and tsunamis. When two of these plates crash into one another, one plate is pulled down, creating an enormous trench at the point of contact. This is how the Mariana Trench was formed. It's the meeting place where two plates collided. Of course, these plates are huge. The Mariana Trench is not only deep, it's long too. It goes on for about 1,500 miles and is 43 miles wide. It's also roughly 180 million years old. But what you might not believe is that the Mariana Trench is not the closest point to the center of the Earth, even though it is the deepest place on Earth. You would actually be closer to the center of the planet if you were standing on the surface of the Arctic Ocean at the geographic North Pole. The Deepest Trash Even though the Mariana Trench is so deep, so limitless, and so mysterious, it has not been spared the horrors of humanity. A recent and disturbing report from National Geographic confirmed that a piece of trash, a plastic bag specifically, was found at the deepest point in the ocean. This plastic bag is now recognized as the deepest piece of litter in the world. It was found at an exact depth of 36,000 feet. Scientists working with the Deep Sea Debris Database have been checking out a collection of photographs taken over the past 30 years, and what they found is that the most prevalent debris in the ocean is throwaway plastic, meaning shopping bags and plastic water bottles. 
about 89% in total. A separate study recently suggested that the Mariana Trench shows higher levels of pollution in certain areas than many of the most polluted rivers found throughout Asia. The thinking behind the theory is that chemical pollutants enter the trench from many other places in the ocean, brought in on the water column. Some fear that by the time we're actually able to explore the Mariana Trench in its fullness, the whole thing will be a polluted pit of death. Future Exploration There is still a lot of interest in exploring the Mariana Trench. It's just that most people doing it happen to be rich philanthropists, like I told you about. A man named Larry Connor is scheduled to make two dives into the Mariana Trench in April 2021. According to USA Today, Larry Connor will be diving to a depth of more than 35,000 feet. He plans on visiting Challenger Deep and Sirena Deep, both of which are in the Mariana Trench. These dives will be happening in mid-April of 2021, so keep your eyes open for any new discoveries. The crew will be spending about four hours at the bottom of the trench conducting scientific research. Larry is using the Hadal Exploration System for his dives, the only deep exploration facility in the whole world. He will also be accompanied by Patrick Leahy, considered to be the most experienced submersible pilot in the world. And as if going to the two deepest points on Earth wasn't enough, Larry is also scheduled for a mission to the International Space Station in 2022. That will make Larry the only person to travel from the deepest point on Earth to outer space. No easy feat. Rabbits discover artifacts. Archaeologists recently received help from an unlikely group, a herd of rabbits whose burrowing on the remote Welsh island of Skokholm unearthed a trove of prehistoric artifacts dating back to the Stone Age. Situated west of Wales in the Celtic Sea, Skokholm only has two human residents, a pair of wardens and seabird experts named Richard Brown and Giselle Eagle, who discovered the archaeological treasures that the rabbits had dug up. They spotted an artifact at the entrance of a burrow near the island's cottage and sent photos to experts on the mainland, who identified it as a Mesolithic tool. Known as a beveled pebble, the item is estimated to be between 6,000 and 9,000 years old. Stone Age hunters likely used it to prepare food, such as shellfish, and or to make boats from seal hides. Although similar tools have been found in Pembrokeshire, Cornwall, and other nearby sites, it's the first time one has appeared on Skokholm. The day after the initial discovery, Brown and Eagle found even more artifacts, including pottery fragments and another tool, in the same place where they found the first one. Jody Deacon, curator of prehistoric archaeology at the National Museum of Wales, identified the pottery as an early Bronze Age burial urn, dating back some 3,750 years. Based on the findings, Royal Commission of Wales archaeologist Toby Driver suspects that the cottage was built on top of an early Bronze Age burial mound, which was built over a Middle Stone Age hunter-gatherer settlement. And it's all thanks to the bunnies. These discoveries are all first for the tiny island, which has served as a national nature reserve since 2006. A cult that exhumed the dead. When archaeologists first unearthed a collection of flint artifacts at a large Neolithic village in northern Jordan's Zarka River Valley, they initially suspected that the objects were prehistoric tools. But they were not. Dating back roughly 10,000 years to 7,500 BC, the violin-shaped artifacts appear to be figurines, representing their ancient owner's deceased relatives. They were likely used by an ancestor cult in the ritualistic burial and exhumation of the dead, according to a team of Spanish archaeologists who published a study on the discovery last year. Body parts from some of the seven original burials at the site appear to have been dug up and reburied, coinciding with the idea that the figurines were related to this ritual. The figurines are the only flint artifacts ever found in Jordan that date back to the early Paleolithic or Neolithic periods with other human representations from the time and area having been carved from limestone and ivory. The researchers wrote that the objects reflect a conceptual and artistic revolution that occurred in the Near East as humans transitioned from hunting and gathering to agriculture. This change is reflected in the shift from animals to humans as the primary focus of ancient imagery. Extinct Cave Bear Late last year, a group of reindeer herders discovered the frozen carcass of an extinct cave bear high above the Arctic Circle in Siberia's remote Lyakovsky Islands. They promptly alerted researchers at the Northeastern Federal University, or NEFU, who came to get it so they could study it. The animal died as an adult, probably sometime between 22,000 and 39,500 years ago, and quickly became encased in ice 
which kept its nose, teeth, and internal organs remarkably intact into modern times. It's the first wholly preserved specimen scientists have had the opportunity to examine, as only skeletal cave bear remains were found before then. According to experts, the cave bear was an ancient species or subspecies that roamed what is now Europe and Asia, alongside other Ice Age giants, including mammoths, saber-toothed cats, woolly rhinos, and giant ground sloths, before going extinct around 15,000 years ago. Weighing around 1,300 pounds on average, with the largest specimens tipping the scales at up to 2,200 pounds, fully grown males were considerably larger than modern bears. Scientists must conduct more tests to determine the bear's precise age and hope to obtain a DNA sample for genetic analysis. If possible, they plan to compare the information to the DNA of a frozen cave bear cub that was found around the same time in another patch of permafrost. Bull Rock Cave Located in the Blensko area of South Moravia, Czech Republic, the Bull Rock Cave is famous for its archaeological discoveries. It is part of the country's second longest cave system, and it's shrouded in mystery. In 1872, Czech archaeologist Jindrik Wankel discovered a settlement inside the cave belonging to the Bronze Age Hallstatt culture, which existed from the 12th century BC to the 6th century BC. Wongo also claimed that he found the brutally dismembered skeletons of 40 young women, including some who were beheaded and others with missing limbs. Nearby was a small altar holding severed arm and hand bones hacked off at the elbow and a skull sliced cleanly down the middle. Wonkel also found what he believed were the remains of a chariot containing a charred human skeleton. The archaeologist concluded that he had discovered the grave of a Hallstatt nobleman and 40 ritually killed young women perhaps 40 virgins, but he was woefully mistaken as later investigations identified 17 of the skeletons as male and determined that the individuals ranged in age from children up to 60 years old. There was actually no proof that the people died violently. Moreover, the so-called chariot turned out to be the remains of three different vehicles unrelated to one another. Nobody knows exactly what went on at Bull Rock Cave at some point between 700 and 650 BC. But because ironworking was considered a magical process in the region at the time, Hallstatt expert Martin Golek theorized that the deceased individuals were perhaps ritually sacrificed by blacksmith priests to ensure that their work was successful. But the skeleton's origins are also unknown, as the relics found in the cave, including amber and bronze objects, glass beads, sheet metal vessels, textiles, and ceramic goods came from various places, including Italy, the Baltic, and the Caucasus. And so, the mystery continues. Where are the medium-sized dinosaurs? Some of the most bizarre archaeological discoveries aren't artifacts themselves, but a lack thereof. Paleontologists have long wondered why medium-sized carnivorous dinosaurs are practically missing from the fossil record. There are huge ones and tiny ones, but what about the medium ones? Scientists have just announced that they may have finally answered this question. A new study notes the conspicuous absence of medium-sized dinosaurs, especially those dating back to the Cretaceous period amid a plethora of massive and small ones. It raises the possibility that young megatheropods, the largest meat-eating dinosaurs, are to blame for the lack of medium-sized species. Juvenile megatheropods may have outcompeted other medium-sized dinosaurs, resulting in deflated global dinosaur diversity, lead researcher Catlin Schroeder said. Schroeder and her colleagues made their findings by analyzing data from the Paleobiology Database, a comprehensive collection of paleontological data. They found herbivorous dinosaurs of all sizes, but discovered that many dinosaur communities with megatheropods rarely contained medium-sized carnivores. Schroeder says it's possible that the gap was being caused by juveniles of those large megatheropods, which may have been eating different things than their parents, and therefore competing with medium-sized carnivores. Not all experts agree with the research, including Michael Demick, an associate professor in the Department of Biology at Adelphi University in New York, who pointed out the very real possibility that there are fossils of medium-sized carnivores that we just haven't found yet. But in case they never do, we probably know why. Magical Childbirth Girdle According to a new study, a 10-foot-long strip of parchment featuring Christian emblems was once used as a magical amulet. Made from four strips of sheepskin that were stripped thin and sewn together, the girdle likely dates back to the late 15th century. 
It's adorned with religious imagery, including pictures of the nails of the crucifixion, the holy monogram IHS, a standing figure that may represent Jesus, crucifixion wounds with blood dripping from them, and Christian texts. It was meant to protect women during pregnancy and childbirth in medieval England. Known as a birthing girdle or a birthing scroll, the rare artifact contains traces of plant and animal proteins from ingredients that were used to treat health problems during pregnancy, as well as human proteins from actual births. Biochemist and lead study author Sarah Fittiment said that this particular girdle shows evidence of having been heavily handled, since much of the image and text have been worn away. It also has a lot of stains on it, so it looks like it was actively used. Chemical tests revealed the presence of honey, cereals, legumes such as beans, and sheep or goat milk, which were all used in medieval remedies to treat pregnancy ailments. Birthing girdles were popular at a time when it was common for women to die during childbirth as a way to protect them from the dangers associated with pregnancy and having babies. These scrolls were worn wrapped around the waist and the baby bump for good luck. They fell out of favor starting in 1536 during Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries when the ill-reputed monarch targeted these and other church rituals for destruction. During this time, birthing girdles gained a reputation as a forbidden religious practice that relied on supernatural help beyond the Holy Trinity. For this reason, only a few birthing girdles are known to have survived into modern times. Based on the wear and tear of this one, as well as the ample amount of human proteins found on it, it was probably used in hundreds of births. Winged Shark 93 million years ago, during the time of the dinosaurs, a strange-looking shark with a gaping mouth and wing-like fins swam through the world's oceans. The recently described species, Aquilolamna milarche, or the eagle shark, somewhat resembled manta and devil rays, which did not emerge into existence for another 30 million years. Like those animals, it was a filter feeder, feasting on plankton and other microscopic creatures. The study is based on a fossil discovered in 2012 in the Nuevo León state of northeastern Mexico, which was submerged in water at the time when the eagle shark lived. Known as the Western Interior Seaway, this body of water stretched from the modern-day Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean. Unlike any of today's sharks, the eagle shark had long, slender fins that made it wider than it was long, according to lead study researcher Romain Villo. Its body measured around 5.4 feet long, while its wingspan was roughly 6.2 feet long. Another interesting feature is that the head is short, with an indistinct snout and a wide mouth, Willow explained. The other parts of the aquilolamna, such as its tail and caudal fin, are like those in many modern sharks. This gives to aquilolamna a unique chimeric appearance. The eagle shark had body parts from both of the two distinct body types that are seen among modern plankton-eating elasmobranchs, the group of sharks, rays, and other fish with skeletons made from cartilage. It possessed features of the traditional shark body, seen in today's whale sharks, and species with flattened bodies like manta and devil rays. These characteristics resulted not as a precursor to evolution, but from something known as convergent evolution, when different groups of creatures evolve independently to have similar features. The eagle shark was likely a somewhat slow swimmer that used its elongated fins as stabilizers and possibly to propel its body through the water, but the only known fossilized specimen is incomplete. Its teeth are missing, leaving scientists unsure of what kind of shark it was. With such limited evidence to go on, they also do not know when it went extinct. Anti-Vampire Amulet A recently deciphered inscription on a 1,600-year-old amulet claims to protect the wearer from flesh-eating and blood-sucking evil spirits, according to a new study by archaeologists. The text is written in Mandaic, the ancient language used by the Mandaeans, an ethnic group that has lived in what is now southern Iraq and Iran for thousands of years. Resembling a long, thin piece of lead when unfolded, the amulet measures roughly 8 inches long and 1.7 inches wide. It was intended for a man named Abiyya. The 62-line incantation reads, In the name of life, may there be health to the spirit and soul of Abiyya, the son of Mahua. It also calls on the archangel Gabriel to throw down, bind, strike, kill, and fetter the demon and to stop spirits who eat flesh and drink blood from harming Abiyya. The amulet is one of three such scrolls purchased by Center College in Danville, Kentucky in 2009 for $5,000. Because so many artifacts from southern Iraq have been looted in recent decades, its traceable provenance makes it especially valuable, 
as many journals will not publish research on items lacking proof that they were not stolen. By deciphering the inscription, experts stand to learn more about the Mandaeans' complex religion, which blends elements of several different belief systems. Modern-day Mandaeans still practice some of the age-old traditions of their religion. They are strict non-pacifists who do not believe in using violence under any circumstances, including self-defense, and they ritually immerse themselves in water as a way to purify themselves. The Childhood Home of Jesus Archaeologists working in Nazareth in modern-day Israel announced the possible discovery of Jesus Christ's childhood home. Made partially from mortar and stone walls, the modest first-century structure was built into a hillside. Nuns at the Sisters of Nazareth convent first discovered the remains in the 1880s underneath their church, but it was not dated back to Jesus' time until 2006, when archaeologist Ken Dark identified it as a place people believed Christ grew up for centuries following his death. Dark admits that it's unknown whether Jesus actually lived in the modest dwelling, but said it's entirely possible. It's impossible to say on archaeological grounds, he conceded in an article published in Biblical Archaeology Review. On the other hand, there is no good archaeological reason why such an identification should be discounted. After all, the structure was found where Jesus is believed to have grown up, and the site remained protected well into the Byzantine era, when it was decorated with mosaics and a church known as the Church of the Nutrition was built on top. At some point, the site fell into disrepair, and Crusaders fixed it up in the 12th century upon their arrival to the Holy Land. The Nazareth Archaeological Project gained full access to the site in 2006, at which point experts examined previous drawings of the dwelling and reconstructed its development. Inside the home, they found broken cooking pots, a spindle whorl used for spinning thread, and limestone vessels. According to Jewish beliefs, limestone could not be made impure, suggesting that a Jewish family lived in the home. The modest home was abandoned sometime during the first century. Two other first century houses have been identified in Nazareth in recent years, making for just a handful of remains from that time period ever found there. Thanks for watching! Which discovery was your favorite? Mine was the mysterious Bull Rock Caves. Or maybe the Ice Age Bear. I'm not sure. Which one surprised you the most? Let me know in the comments below. And remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you later.